Season 3, Episode 1 of Strange Brow Radio. My name's Tobe Johnson. Thanks for joining me, subscribing, all that good stuff that you already do. Today's show is entitled UFO Disclosure. Why shouldn't it be? Seeing what's coming our way. UFO Disclosure Conscious Control, more like it. Because I believe there is a type of orchestration and control going on here. Choreo choreographing a message and we'll talk all about that live and have a few voices on besides my own here in a moment so don't go anywhere we'll be right back all right so today's show ufo disclosure conscious control is a conversation between me and you no real scheduled guests lined up for today, just me behind the microphone upstairs here in my little studio. And I probably will insert periodically throughout this, or pepper I guess is the right word, guests that have called in previously contributing on their own sightings, UFO disclosure and what it means to them, and some audio clips as well along the way that I think are important will add something to the conversation but let's go ahead and get started and before we do let's talk a little bit about the territory we've been down the roads we've been down we've talked uh, a lot about cryptozoology in particular Sasquatch based upon a lot of first-hand experiences you've heard my story now we're getting into the world of 3D sculpting, rendering. I can't express enough how much people should go back and watch the episode Blondie Revealed with our guest Lisa Lichen and our new sponsors over at MetallicMonsters.com. Go check them out. But sometimes it's nice just to sit back and do a debrief over my own point of view. We've talked a lot about the Al Moon Lab and Cottage Grove, but I haven't really focused in like a tractor beam on the UFO phenomena. So I thought it was high time we did it, given the fact that there seems to be a due date, a deadline for the upcoming coronavirus relief bill that snuck in information coming down, directed information coming down supposedly from the Pentagon. And they've given dribs and drabs along the way, as I said, about uh, what they think the phenomena isn't. And I think foreign adversaries is one of the things they said this isn't, which is a pretty major thing. It's either us or foreign adversaries or something other, right? Certainly not only swamp gas or ball lightning. Wouldn't that be something if the Pentagon got that one wrong? And we've had other witnesses take a look at this, other experts in the field take a look at this, scientists, astrophysicists, astronomers, now NASA's taking a look at it, Neil deGrasse Tyson. I heard him the other day take a look at it and blame it was all on calibration of instruments on fighter jets and aircraft carriers. And that if we could only get the instrumentation correctly, then we could just see the error of our ways. But it doesn't work that way, Neil. Not when you're an eyewitness and you've seen these objects before. Now, we don't need to rehash over the same old territory what kind of craft there are, but the Tic Tac shaped object, refreshingly sweet object spotted by Commander Favor, uh, is something that is relatively new on the scene as far as witness description of seeing a floating, what looks like white propane tank uh, gliding or floating across the sky at incredible speeds and ang angles. The Black Triangle is something that has been described along the years a little bit more so, than I, in my opinion, than the Tic Tac-shaped object. So we'll be going over what exactly this Black Triangle could be and some of the points of view. I don't know if you've heard along the way of back engineering something called the Aurora or the TR-3B that uses a pulse engine or anti-gravity generator of some kind. So interesting food for thought. We'll talk about all this along the way. Hey, if you want to help out the show, you can do that. You can go over and you can subscribe to Patreon over at patreon.com forward slash 
Strange Brow Radio, and there you'll find the 369 Club. You can donate if you want. You can subscribe to the Patreon channel, and there you'll get added bon- bonus content. Because this is a weekly show. The seasons are broken up more or less monthly, but I do a weekly show, and the people over at Patreon, Patreon get this. And so that's your chance to join in the fun over at patreon.com forward slash strange bow radio or you can go over to youtube and just hit the subscribe and like and make a comment in the youtube uh, section there or share it and that also does a lot for the show so thank you again for doing that in advance also i want to thank our sponsors over at metallicmonsters.com and feral by aaron over at etsy.com our two only sponsors we have for this show here. And so we we appreciate them, and I'll tell you more about them later as well. Now, this show was broken up into two parts. We did a live episode of this exact same conversation uh, last week. And so I'm doing an addendum to that, a part two, because there's some added stuff that we didn't get to along the way. So if you had a chance to listen to that, uh, I'm glad you did. Uh, But here is the revamped special edition uh, of this as well. So I wanted to start off by talking about some personal experiences that I've had along the way with the subject matter. And it all starts with a childhood memory of sitting down at a matinee show. I believe we were actually house-sitting, and a show popped up around 11.30 at night. It was the late-night edition with commercial breaks, of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And I've spoken a little bit about this again, but it goes to show you how much the image means to a child, especially in those formative years. And the show, especially the scene with Roy Neary and Richard Dreyfuss, as he's sitting there at the kitchen table with his family, trying to deal with some latent memories of what could be either a UFO abduction or an interaction or a message coming from a non-human entity, in this case, Little Greys. And so he's sitting there making a a mountain out of a molehill, more like a mountain out of mashed potatoes, and says the line, this means something. And not quite sure why him making a mountain out of mashed potatoes means anything at all. But that greater question got me to look into the paranormal, like so many of you probably along the way. And so it took a while to take my first encounter case. And my first encounter story didn't happen till probably, oh, the early 80s, late 70s, where I heard rumors about my grandmother's side of the family having interaction with ETs. And in particular, three or four little greys, from what they described, one night... On 101 outside of Walport, Oregon, three or four grays walking across 101 and floating off of the ridge down into the surf below. And there really is no other way for someone to walk down or float down off the edge of 101 than uh, what she described, because it is a, a treacherous drop of generally 100 feet or better. And so... I heard that story. They kind of stuck to it. They said they were little small people, little small beings that went across the road in tight-fitting suits, and nothing more was really said about it until later I heard that the same family also described seeing a saucer land in their backyard. I think it was a daytime sighting, and they actually saw beings come off a saucer-shaped craft in their own backyard. Now, I know that one of the witnesses that saw this I won't say any names, um, was extremely apprehensive of physical touch. Um, That was always warned to me that you don't give that person a hug goodbye when they come over and visit. And it didn't really fit the mold of this person's personality because other than that, you didn't see anything that separated you from them. But it always made me wonder, like, man, is that the person that saw the craft? Is that the person that had the incident? And if so, can you not touch them because they're traumatized by the feeling of being, I don't know, handled by something otherworldly? Now, maybe that's a bridge too far. 
But these are the kind of questions that I, I don't even think I was a teenager yet was batting around in his brain long before the world of the X-Files. And then fast forward to, I believe, 1989 time frame. My mother comes home after taking a friend to a lecture on chemotherapy. And she's driving home, driving this woman home. And as she's driving her home through the little town of Springfield, Oregon, over the town of Thurston, she sees what looks like the first star. And as the traffic comes to a stop at a stoplight, they notice that this bright star where there really shouldn't be a star, turns into a black triangle and forms a perfectly black uh, triangle over their sunroof of their Volkswagen Jetta that they were in. And everybody, I believe, looked up, according to the story, and saw this black triangle floating over the town of Springfield. And it had little dots, because I, I made sure I wrote down the detail of this. It had three lights on each apex of the triangle and then simply just blinked out of view or went straight up in such a flash that uh, it was, you know, uh, unmistakable from a blink. So there was story number two. Now this was getting closer to home. And then around 2012 time frame, I would go and see my own lights, very unique in nature. It was up above the town of Lieberg, Oregon, and we were in prime Bigfoot habitat. And as we're sitting, looking out over the trees at 1130 at night, we're camping up in a forest waiting for something squatchy to happen. We see what looks like, without a doubt, looks like a giant white explosion in front of the tree canopy explode. And it stair steps to the left in plain view, unmistakable, this giant white light and it made no sound it didn't blind your eye as it opened and closed and it moved to the left stair stepping through the trees on four different flashes over about 30 minutes to 45 minutes <clears throat> changed my life because it did not fit into the category of explainable at all in fact we ran down to that exact area to double check whether or not there was you know, anybody explo uh, not exploding, but anybody that was exploiting and trying to trick us is probably the better way to put that. <clears throat> and it was an explosion of light, a big explosion of light. And it was a pyrotechnic uh, of light. And it didn't fit into the category of a typical UFO sighting by any means. I mean, it wasn't what my uh, grandmother's side of the family saw, nor my mother, or what I'd heard before, but I definitely heard this from other Bigfooters, so <clears throat> now I categorize myself as an experiencer. Around 2017, my son ends up seeing with his mother what looks like over the Coburg Hills a giant black cylinder or tube. They take their smartphone out and begin to try to take a picture of this at close range in daylight over a farmer's field, and no exposure over the uh, the image that was processed. They did an automatic review on the phone screen, nothing there except a little tiny black triangle, kind of tilted on its edge like a kite. Something that was unmistakable from the frame that apparently both of them didn't see with their own eyes. So this black tube wasn't there, but this little tiny black speck, which you zoomed in on, was a black triangle with pixelation distortion around it, which looked like it was inserted in almost photoshopped in as a joke on dad only i'd seen this before including recently with the fighter pilots uh, that had released photographs of two or three different objects and other pictures since then of this distortion around these objects in the sky when you zoom in apparently not photoshopped or pixelated in so wasn't a trick and i, I have no reason to believe that they were been lying to me about that. Then roughly around 2018, everything turns upside down as far as reality with the Al Moon Lab. Massive amount of light seen from all points of view, not only of the by the landowner, Daryl Adams, but also by some of the 
surrounding property owners, the farmers nearby in particular. And so, in fact, let's play an audio clip of a recent interview I did with Daryl Adams about these lights and get his point of view, and then we'll move forward from there. Hey, man, can you hear me all right? I can hear you, but I can't see anything other than your logo. That's okay. We got you, uh, got your audio, which is what we want, man. Now, just explaining to people a little bit about uh, you, but I haven't really explained that you've left from Cottage Grove out uh, towards the East Coast, and uh, you're in the right outside the Siege of Hanobi, right? Uh, yeah, not far away. Yeah, uh-huh. you're in the middle of Oklahoma. Yeah. Yeah. And Daryl, you're no uh, stranger to the UFO phenomena. In fact, you have family members that actually not have only seen the lights, but you have family members that worked at Area 51. Yeah, my sister-in-law did. Work yeah. yeah. I mean, not not everybody gets a job there. The interview process, from what I hear, uh, it can be pretty bizarro. So that's that's really fascinating that uh, you have that related to you and you're so close to it. Um, but you've seen the UFOs yourself, man. Tell, tell people a little bit about what you've seen and uh, we'll go from there. Um, well, when I was living out in Cottage Grove out by the lake there um, at night, um, I would take my dog to go to the bathroom and, uh, you know, late before we went to bed and that's when I'd mostly see them. So, and what did you see? Uh, just things hover, a thing hovering in the air. The neighbor calls it a chandelier. It's just, a, I don't know, it, it flashes a bunch of different colored lights on and off. Like it's kind of um, like a strobe light almost up in the air. That's just a bunch of different colored lights. It's hard to explain. It looks kind of like a jellyfish or something. And then it'll just dart around, and then it'll just vanish. So, yeah, I saw that, you know, five or six times. Yeah, and you weren't the only one that witnessed There were other people that saw this as well, including the, the neighbor next door, a guy who we called Wormy. Um, and uh, I'll never forget when Wormy came over with what looked a large, looked like a large burn or radiation burn on his forehead. Yeah, yeah. He uh, said he came home from church one Sunday night, and uh, the thing was up in the air. He had been seeing it for oh, I don't know, for around twenty years, I think. And uh, he came home from church one night, and it was in the air, and it was. Um, emitting a light down on the ground, like a real strong spotlight. So he hid behind a big pine tree in his front yard, and he said it was just kind of playing hide-and-go-seek with him, trying to hit him with that spotlight. And then he finally, I guess, ran in the house, and a few days later he had this big, giant, red sunburn on his forehead. He went to the doctor. They told him it's some kind of radiation burn or something, and they wanted it get him like fifteen hundred dollars for some salve but he uh couldn't afford it so that's as far as that went oh there we go there were, um and his wife uh also had some interesting stuff happen where she said that uh she saw this light and she felt like it took a photograph or something of her yeah I, same kind of thing i guess they were coming home from church one sunday night you know it's they don't get home till around 10 and uh it was out there again, and and she said it started flashing like a flashbulb, like it was taking photos of her, and she was trying to run around and get in the house. She didn't like it at all, and yeah. uh, she didn't want to talk much about it. But uh, also, I saw, when I had seen it, it was uh, emitting some little orbs out of the bottom of it up into the forest behind where I lived, where I had recorded all those sawwatch sounds and got all the you know, all the footprints and everything else. And it was just kind of like um, sending these little orbs out out of the ship itself. And it, the ship's not very high in the sky. I mean, it's probably not over a couple thousand feet up. And I saw it, you know, like uh, spit out about five of these things. And then I started recording and I actually caught it 
you know, putting out three or four of them. And every time it would put one of these orbs out, it would kind of distort my phone frequency. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And the, 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 the seeding effect or these little orbs that had come out of this, this light or this craft, um, I've seen the cell phone footage that you've had of it. Uh, they're very qu quick, and they kind of, do they kind of flash as they pop out the belly of this? Are they a solid object, or are they just kind of fl flitting in and out of uh, brightness? Uh, no, I think they're kind of a solid mm -hmm. object. They look like they were just going down to the ground. You know, you kind of lose sight of them when they get into the trees, and there was trees around me, so it was kind of hard to see exactly where they landed. They were definitely landing up in the forest somewhere. And what's your opinion, man, about what's going on here with the soft disclosure? What do you have any insight over what you think's happening with the government talking about UFOs so candidly? Um, I don't know. The government's always got something up their sleeves, so if they're giving out information about that. There's a lot more going on than what they're saying. They're they're only going to give you just a little tidbit of what's really going on. But I don't know why they would call us be releasing this. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. It seems strange. Um, all right. So I want to play a clip here while I have you on here. I'm going to get your take on what I'm about to play, Daryl. Do you have a second? Yeah, I do. Okay. So recently, the, one of the liaison, the spokespeople for the Pentagon, made a statement after a briefing that he gave uh, before the press. And I'm going to play his uh, question and answer. I believe there might be a couple questions directed his way. And again, this is John F. Kirby, the Pentagon liaison, being uh, asked two questions from reporters about UFOs, UAPs, and the way the Pentagon is directing this narrative. So let me set up the share icon here. Now you're going to see my screen. And I did. I wanted to follow up on a couple of things. Um, and the very last follow up, and I hesitate to be asking this, but on the unmanned aerial phenomenon report, because you said, because many of these site reported sightings have been from military personnel, and because you said that DOD is assisting with this effort, can you tell us anything about what you have been able to rule out? Have you been able to rule out the science fiction scenario of any kind of life form? Is this mechanical phenomena? Is this uh, perhaps atmospheric? Can you can you just say? for people who are interested that you have ruled out there's any life forms out there? Uh, I would be getting ahead of a report that hasn't been submitted to Congress yet, and that's never a good idea for a spokesman in this town. So I don't want to get ahead of the report. We'll, uh, uh, and I refer you to DNI to speak to that. that. You can rule out at uh, this point. I am not going to get ahead of a report that this agency is not writing. Uh, in response to a congressional mandate um, that would refer you to DNI for, for more detail about that. We just played a clip of the spokesman from the Pentagon who went over a question that was directed his way by a reporter that point blank asked <laughs> this, uh, the liaison of the Pentagon whether or not they were able to rule out a science fiction answer, i.e., alien beings being pilots of these craft or whether or not there was a more traditional answer. Um, and so to hear that question phrased from a, a report, I forget if she's from ABC or World News or CNN, but here we have a reporter asking the Pentagon spokesperson if there are alien creatures basically piloting these craft. It blows me away to hear that and mainstream news directed as not some kind of, I don't know, teaser for, you know, Independence Day 5 or something like that. What, what, is your, what do you think of that, Daryl? Do you think people are um, uh, dis distracted too much and aren't paying attention, or what's your opinion of that? Well, if they're mainstream media doing that and they're not making a joke out of it, it's got to be something going on, seriously, I think. 
Yeah. I mean, you know, (laughs) it's like the old Orson Welles War of the Worlds thing, but it's not a joke anymore. So my question to you, Daryl, is do you feel as though COVID, and I'll open this up to anybody who's listening right now, do you feel as though that the pandemic has anything to do with disclosure? And if it does, um, how and why? What? Go ahead and uh, mm. ask that question to the floor. Do you feel like it has anything to do with it? I don't know. You know, America anymore, everything's just out there on the table. So, you know, America's the uh, two weeks later, they've forgotten about everything country now. So. Right. It's, you know, they can slip this stuff in now with the COVID. They can slip in a lot of things because people's minds are somewhere else. Right. And I think, you know, it's got a lot to do with it. Yeah. No, totally. And um, I'm just flipping through my notes here uh, along the way. The uh, there's a, There's a lot to say about what could be speculated as some kind of conscious control over the narrative. I thought that was probably the most important tagline to attach to UFO disclosure because I feel as though that the timing was planned out. I mean, here you have a reporter asking the liaison of the Pentagon whether or not there could be alien beings. She calls it sci-fi answers, piloting craft during a national pandemic. Okay, a pandemic to which the point we, we've we never seen a lockdown like this that I know of, at least in my lifetime, uh, upsetting a world economy and nation states slowly dribbling out information about off-world vehicles. This was another quote from the Pentagon saying that unless somebody can uh, find a way to retract this comment, one of the quotes that came out was about off-world craft or at least metamaterials from craft recovered. And that's a huge deal. And so to have that being brought about as a conversation during a national pandemic and the beginning of this conversation awakening in the New York Times in 2017, two years, three years before COVID, uh, is really interesting to me uh, how all this started. So I don't know what we're, what's in store for the UFO world. The official report should be coming out here, I believe in the next week or two, it's attached, uh, through the COVID relief bill. I know that Marco Rubio out of Florida, prior presidential candidate is immersed in the topic. Senator Harry Reid, who's uh, been immersed in this for quite some time, and a quick anecdotal story here. And, Daryl, I'll let you uh, hop off the line because I know that it's uh, it's getting late later over there. Unless you want to listen, do you want to uh, stay on or do you got to go? I I can go. Yeah, it's already 930. But um, okay. I was also going to say about the UFOs that I saw out there, the UFO, whatever. It's not just something that stays in one form. You know, if you look at the videos, you can see it can – change forms almost i it's hard to explain yeah it is hard to explain it has this organic quality to it like you're watching something change like a a cloud or a ray of sun or something but it is also very unorganic in its mechanics so uh, and you have a brilliant video of it too i mean a lot of people haven't a chance to see this video that you shot but they will soon all right, there's a little interjection from my buddy Daryl over now in Oklahoma, and I'm sure it's not the end of it for him. In fact, I know it isn't. Uh, he'll be getting uh, more information, more sightings, I'm sure, coming his way. Now, when we left off, um, we were making a, a preamble to the Al Moon adventures, and then Around 2019, I move up here to Port Orchard, Washington, and the aerial stuff doesn't end by any means. Mainly, it's witnessed by Aaron, including one time when I'm at work, she witnessed what she called a, a green emerald diamond shape hovering over the trees, and it was just floating along. I think it was in the evening. In fact, I, I know it was because I still have the text, I'm sure. Uh, Another time we had a friend over at our house, um, Sandy Nelson and Kevin Carney stayed the night in our guest trailer, and as Kevin was 
out on the tree line there, taking a moment to himself, he saw what he called two black objects flying in unison in a straight line across the tree line as well and was pretty sure that they weren't owls silently gliding across the tree. I myself have seen the same, at least on one occasion, a black ball of light uh, travel around this trailer. Actually, it was inside the trailer. Floats only a couple feet in front of me, glide and right in front of my face. Very organic looking. It looked like uh, what we're calling an elephant orb. It actually looked like the hide of an animal uh, floating in front of me. That was very crazy. And then this white hockey puck shaped light that we caught in front of us out in one of our trails and it's very hard to explain some of these things unless you see them yourself uh, undulating green ribbons that are flowing that have no real reason of showing up on photographs we've caught those as well mainly out on these trails here and that i think that kind of rounds out what we've seen out here in poor orchard but it being only you know, less than 15 minutes away from Bremerton, where the USS Nimitz is docked, uh, is quite the thing to live with, especially driving out towards Silverdale. You have to go through Bremerton, and there you see the, the, the USS Nimitz docked right there, which is now known in the UFO world as the place where the Tic Tac had flirted with the battle group off the Pacific, I believe. So, Really interesting times to live in. And then COVID hits around 2020. Well, exactly the end of February 2020. It hits in a big way. And maybe a couple months after COVID hit, uh, Aaron and I start tossing back the idea of uh, planning a trip out the to the ET highway. So we did. And we just got back and the video just came out. So... If you're listening to this and you haven't watched it, go watch the previous video called E.T. Highway, where I think it's seven days broken down into 30 minutes, and you'll get a feel for the desert. In particular, a feel for what we did for seven days as we camped in the back of this rental <laughs> minivan and periodically stayed at a couple hotels as well. So... That's where we're headed next. Uh, before we go and talk about that trip, uh, I want to thank you again to our sponsors. Go check out MetallicMonsters.com. If you haven't seen them, MetallicMonsters.com. They are in the area of gaming. So if you're a gamer, that's their forte. Magic the Gathering, Dungeons & Dragons, role-playing games. They make personal pieces, several thousand varieties of you know, goblins and, um, you know, you name what kind of creature you want. They have an inventory of thousands. They make them right here in Issaquah, Washington. They're getting a storefront in, right outside of Seattle, Washington. I don't think the storefront is quite ready yet, but you can go to metallicmonsters.com. Check out their inventory. And they make them out of rare earth materials. A lot of them, people want exotic materials made out and 3D printed out of their metallic monsters, and you can do that. So go go check them out. They're also responsible for commissioning an artist to make Blondie, which is an episode we did with a 3D sculptor by the name of um, Guyton Gray. And he worked with our witness, Lisa Lichen, sculpting this female werewolf, for lack of a better term, for what she was describing. And it's quite the sculpture. It, it takes a while for a 3D sculptor to get there with a witness working with me in the same way that uh, I worked with Alex Whitcomb previous doing witness descriptions of Bigfoot. And a shout out to Alex Whitcomb over at Drifted Creations who just got done making a Drifted Creation Volkswagen bus, which I don't know if you put that out yet, Alex, but um, <laughs> you got to make those pictures public because that's something else. Regardless, uh metallicmonsters.com go check them out and everything they're doing over there and of course my girlfriend the gal with the talent between her hands making 
what I would call Alchemy Sound Tools Museum Quality at that over at Feral by Aaron, E-R-Y-N. That's how you spell it. It's an Etsy shop with five stars. Those stars, man, oh man, they mean a lot to the Etsy seller, and she's got all five of them. So it's a busy time of year uh, for her. We're, we're watching sales fluctuate off and on as the summer season comes around. But if you can go over and take a look and just click the little heart button as you check out her inventory and like share some of the stuff on there. Also, that helps. Also, uh, if you see something you like, go ahead and buy one of those. You won't be disappointed or buy something for a friend over at Feral by Aaron over at Etsy. Okay, so as I was saying before, we're planning a trip out to the ET Highway. We just got back some couple weeks ago, and now you've got this 30-minute video out there, which doesn't do it justice, but I'll, in short here, let's break this down over what happened. So when you're going on a road trip, you want to make sure you're prepared for almost everything, including, in my case, interviews and camera equipment and bedding, especially if you're going to sleep in the back of a minivan or possibly camp so we packed a lot and if we had it to do all over again we would have cut what we packed in half and the bedding in particular is probably something we wouldn't cut down on because you really do want to be comfortable when you're on the road because you may or may not get a shower but in our case we did okay in that department and so Fast forward to the first place that we went from Port Orchard to the ghost town, the historic ghost town of Virginia City. Made our way over a period of two days to an elevation of 6,500 feet up to the ghost town of Virginia City and enter into two places were on our bucket list. And that would have been the Bucket of Blood Saloon, which if you watch this video I have out, I have an interview on how Bucket of Blood got its name. And then I wander in quite accidentally into the haunted bar saloon called the Washoe Club or Washoe Club. Also home to what's called the Millionaire's Club, which is upstairs above this bar, an incredibly haunted part of this bar. Now, as I'm walking through the town... I know I'm diverting a little bit from the UFO talk here, but I think it's all cross-pollinating nicely, in my opinion. As I walk into this bar, I have my iOvulist ghost box on, and it's a, a random word generator for lack of better explanation on, on their behalf of what it's doing, but it picks out words randomly, and sometimes it's right on and sometimes it's not. And as I walk in accidentally into the Washu Club, it says the word Nick. Now, I have the phone in my pocket like everybody else, and then it says brown. And so I hear this Stephen Hawking-type robotic voice generated out of my pocket. Uh, so does everybody in the bar, mind you. And I said, where am I? And I said, you're in the Washoe Club. And I said, well, I'm an idiot. I, I meant to come in here, and here I am. And I said, who's Nick? And the guy, the only guy really sitting at the bar says, I'm Nick. <laughs> And I said, okay. And he goes, okay, well, this thing, you know, this iOvulus app here said Nick. So it might be talking about you, but then it said, you know, Brown. And he goes, well, that's not my last name, but that's my skin color. And so we had a good chuckle. And so I, you know, was maybe on a roll with this iOvulus. We sat down at the bar, order a Guinness, uh, kick back, and basically madness ensues with conversation check out the washoe club and do our rounds in virginia city then we go from the washoe club down to well right before that point i should mention that we just left klamath falls and as we're driving from k falls along i believe it's called eagle lake or something like that we see these spirit walls um which is something that Ira Wolfnosen has talked about outside of Mount Shasta. And these walls align with the road as well as the lake. And they go from small stones in a line to very large megalithic sized stones stacked up. And they just undulate and flow like a river. They go up the mountain to the side of the mountain all around. They look like ancient walls that she had spoke spoken about and her theory of course is that they are 
basically mimicking earth lines. And so these are the first time I've seen these these walls. And we're outside of Mount Shasta by some distance. So I'm already kind of like in the mode of there's things going on here with some of the guests that we've spoken to along the way and including Ira Wolfnosen. In fact, let me go ahead and insert my conversation I just had with Ira over our last live broadcast and get her point of view on some of this. And then we'll go back to what happened after we left Virginia City. Hey, Ira. Yeah. How I are you doing? I wasn't I'm good. I wasn't going to call in, but I had a question for yeah. you guys. Mhm. Go ahead. So after 70 years of hiding this and denying this, why now? Well, that was my last question that I had here too, and I suppose that uh you know, you might have more specific answers. So, uh, tell me your theory. Uh, well, I don't know <laughs> if I have, I don't know if I have a theory, but it seems like, um, whoever, whoever has been denying this and whoever has been, uh, keeping it secret for 70 years and working so hard to do that, that the only way they would freely start talking about it would be because it served a reason. And generally it's follow the money or follow the control. And again, 70 years, what are you, what are you referring to going back to 70 years? I think it's been about 70 years that we have had a government saying, no, there's nothing out there when clearly there was a lot of things out there. I mean, go back to Mount Rainier when it first started, what was that? 1946 or Mm -hmm. something. And, um, throughout all this time, airline pilots, military people don't talk about it. Reports go missing. I mean, if you listen to all the deep researchers, um, who come up with the documents and, and present in a, in a really professional way. That's all I've heard for the last 15 years is people are told that no or have the experience within the government um, structure not to talk about it. Do you feel like this is at all linked to COVID? Um, not in the way that, that you would think. Um, I think COVID also is gosh, I am really stick in my neck out saying this, but you know how I feel about that. You know, you, you have a crisis and then there are those who make the best of the crisis. Never let a good crisis go to waste. So I just ask, you know, why now when it comes to the UFO phenomenon? Why now are we going to be transparent, allegedly? I don't think we are. Right. Because the technology... To me, just my little humble opinion seems to be consciousness based, meaning the technology that you see is somehow related to consciousness. So if you're a civilization that's thousands of years ahead of us, we're just now exploring consciousness in a scientific and and an open way where people are beginning to see that consciousness does have power. It's not just magic and shamanism and woo. So if you fast forward a few 3,000 years and you, you, your quantum physics has become something even more advanced and outlandish, you would have technology that was interfacing with consciousness. And you see that already happening. You see things where people can think something and the light turns blue. You've seen, you know, the, the tests and the experiments are there but very, very rudimentary, but we'll get there. And so if you look at some of these craft and these beings and they're very magical and they appear and they disappear and they, they seem to be traveling at the speed of thought rather than the speed of light, because even if the, at the speed of light, how could they get here from another solar system? It would still take 200 years or something. So they, they have to be using something that's technology that's consciousness related, that travels at the speed of consciousness, that also is, is something that we can't even wrap our minds around right now. So why after 70 years of hiding this, would they just now come out and say, oh, you know, we don't know what the Tic Tacs are. We don't know what this uh, cigar shape thing is, but here's, 
here's some radar stuff with it. I don't think these things would show up on radar. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe some of the other things are, you know, terrestrial, basically. Right. And I, as you're saying, Tic Tac, I'm kicking myself for not mentioning the fact that uh, Daryl Adams is really one of the only people I know that has caught the Tic Tac, what appears to be the Tic Tac on his cell phone. I haven't seen a lot of other footage in color of a floating yeah. propane tank gliding across the tree line. So um, sorry about that, Daryl, if you're listening. But yeah, we do have that yeah. footage. And, um, you know, from coming back fresh off of a trip from the Nevada desert, really are my first one. Um, one of the things I haven't mentioned publicly here is your association with, also you can look up Ira over at heartunafraid.com. You can find her uh, in one of our previous talks that we did on Power Spots. But throughout her um, presentation, her fantastic presentation that we did a couple months ago, um, you'll hear her talk about these walls, these spirit walls that flow up and down um, you know, not only the Siskiyou Corridor, but up north here as well and south of California. And while we were down near uh, one of the lakes in Nevada, off to the left of the lake, including in Cay Falls, we see these walls start to flow, undulate by the lake as we're driving uh, north and south of the lake. And these walls interconnect with the mountain and flow almost like a river up and down the hillside and range in size from small stones to giant megalithic stones, way too large for most even heavy machinery to move around. And so, um, you know, to see these things out, you have to go on these field trips, first of all, in order to even see these things. But um, I just want to thank you for opening up our eyes to looking for something like that, because I think a lot of people are mentioning these modern day miracles just out there for us all to enjoy. Yeah, I think that these walls are also built, of course, I believe they're built upon the telluric currents, um, the natural earth energies you can measure them. But these are, these are always built in places where there is a lot of ritual and ceremony and people felt they were sacred areas because why? Because they were seeing things in the sky, they were seeing you know, cryptids, they were having spiritual experiences. And so why is it that these things seem to go into places where if you boil down all the things I just said, they're things of consciousness, mm -hmm. you know, they're things where we go, that's paranormal things, right. things that are paranormal are things of consciousness. So there's something to all this, but um, as for why now, you know, after all the secrecy, you know, I've thought about that a thousand times. I've listened to a million podcasts and read a million books. And I've looked at it from so many different angles, from Western magic to shamanism to science to, mm -hmm. you know. But I, I really don't have the answer as to why now. I don't think anybody does except whoever's releasing this, this um, announcement this month. I have to think that it's just, um, you know, a human thing. There, it's a human that's wanting to bring this forward. So it's got to be about money or control. It's it's a part of the, you know, the basic psyop that we've been under since what 1995 or something. Right. <laughs> Moving towards this whole globalization and, you know, confusion and keep us in fear and just keep hitting us with with bizarre things that we can't barely wrap our minds around whether it be wear masks for the next 10 years or right you know so all right era we will be in touch thanks for calling in and uh, i will talk to you soon all right that was era wolfnosen again of heart com. you can check out her previous powerpoints and presentations she's done with us live as well as her website now after we left virginia city we headed south to the town of Tonopah. And we'd been on the road for a couple of days, not done any of the necessary things that people do when they are in a hotel room. And we decided we'd look into the possibility of getting a room at a place called the Clown Motel, which is infamous for decor and it being haunted. Right next door in the parking lot to a cemetery which is supposedly 
uh, haunted as well. Now, maybe these are all way to trap tourist bucks as they fly through the highway and stay at this $80 a night hotel, um, which is, you know, a nice room at a reasonable price. And we stayed the night there and we were without incident. Uh, we, we had a great stay, lots of crazy stuff, you know, Pennywise paintings in your room, uh, the many other disturbing paintings all over this room. The gift shop has lots of stuff going on. I believe the owner's name is Haim. He does a lot of the original artwork. You can type in Clown Motel. I think there's a horror movie that was just shot there entitled by the same name. But our mission is to find some more UFO stuff and to gradually get ourselves closer to the ET Highway and Area 51. So I'd heard rumors about the Tonopah Air Station, mainly from a couple videos I watched. And people were claiming that there were creatures out at this abandoned airfield, including what they call gremlins, which sound like a good time to me. So we headed out there in search of gremlins, ended up bringing my night vision camera, setting up on a tripod near an old abandoned uh, hangar. And immediately when we started walking the perimeter, we saw what looked like a white star glowing off way over the distance near some of the testing grounds that are out that way. Now, I don't know if it was like the Tonopah missile test site or if it was area 51 proper but over the hill there was this bright white light and i kind of assumed that it was a, maybe a plane getting ready to land it it was you know just hovering there and so we ignored it and then aaron noticed that the light blinked out and when it blinked out i didn't see it i didn't have my camera rolling i don't believe so anyway and so we went back to the car to get the camera set up. And I think within the hour, the sun had started to set. And we just sat there in lawn chairs and waited. And then that's when we saw what we saw. Now, I can't really describe it well, except it looked like plasma balls opening and closing in elevation to what I believe was a star in orbit near this bright star. And you have to go watch the video in order to see what I'm describing. It's, uh, I don't know what we're looking at. I don't believe this is flares. I sent it, the video off to a couple pilot friends of mine. I haven't heard back from them. I'd love your opinion if this is flares. Uh, it's pretty interesting uh, how it uh, presents itself. Of course, I don't know what the latest in flare technology looks like. And it looks like, you know, uh, some plasma balls. <laughs> Uh, hovering in the sky, just these buttercream yellow looking lights. Of course, that could be the smog based upon the elevation or distortion uh, of the my own eye or the camera. But you can check it out. And as well as we saw up close and personal, what looked like, well, without a doubt, is known as Starlink and this string of pearls floating through the sky. Now, I'd seen it in the Pacific Northwest on one occasion and uh, over the Blue Mountains as well, but I'd never seen it in Tonopah. And given the fact that the skies were super clear that night, uh, we got some really good video of the supposed Starlink. And I have a theory here. I'm going to go ahead and put this theory out there and leave it for some homework for somebody who has more time than me. But these lights look like they're connected in a certain way that may be organized for a certain reason. And so when you see Starlink, it's basically lights pushed together in a string of pearls close and spread apart. Well, that looks a lot like Morse code to me. So I, you know, I don't have time and I haven't done the research to validate this theory of mine, but what if <laughs> this is a message of some kind and maybe it's just an Elon Musk message about the cyber truck coming out or some kind of dumb sales pitch. And I don't think he's a proponent uh, over any of this conversation about contact or extraterrestrial or UFO craft, but maybe he's privately has different points of view. And so I, my challenge to you 
is if you know Morse code and you have time to look at all the footage that's out there of Starlink, including my own, and you want more high-resolution video, get in touch with me because there could be a there there. There might be a message in Morse code. Now, I would think within the first couple of dots and dashes that are being studied, if this thing is moving in an orbit from left to right, let's say, you should be able to... Um, you know, go back and read over this the same way you would with Morse code and come up with a message within the first couple dots and dashes and say, oh my gosh, this is actually forming a word or sentence. It's a wild theory. I get it. But man, um, I've been, uh, you know, affected by just how crazy this looks. So go check out the, uh, the video of that over on YouTube. From Tonopah, our mission was to get uh, south as far as we could. Now, it's a long haul. It felt like a long haul from Tonopah to Las Vegas. Now, looking back, Las Vegas was maybe an area that we could have passed over just in general to stay the night there, but um, I'd never really done a Vegas overnight. I did once when I was in the service, so we, we looked at a way to do that. We ended up staying at the Treasure Island for one night on Memorial Day weekend, which if we had that to do over again, uh, man, oh, man, we would not have booked a room on Memorial Day weekend in Vegas. It was game on. It was fully open. Everybody was had a post-COVID party attitude on the first big holiday that, uh, you know, was after the big CDC press conference where they're basically saying, hey, if you got vaccinated, go for it. And so they were. And aside from, you know, hanging out in a hotel room and uh, going out to grab a bite to eat, we actually had some fairly good food in Vegas. And the next morning, we're getting ready to leave town. And there's a couple things that we're constantly crossing off our bucket list, like the ET Highway is a big one. But I know where I am and the possibilities. There's lots of museums out there. It's not that I could get on video, but I wanted to get to the Bigelow hangar. Um, and so we looked up Rob, Robert Bigelow Aerospace, and it took me to what I was suspecting was one of the main hangars there beyond the razor wire. And you can go look up Bigelow Aerospace and see what I'm talking about. And, of course, his relationship to everything, UFO and including Skinwalker Ranch is, well, you probably know the story better than me. Instead, it took us to a neighborhood. And as we came around the corner, we saw these wrought iron gates. And beyond the wrought iron gates was this castle of a house. And at this castle of a house um, in the parking lot was four or three small cargo vans that said Bigelow Aerospace and I looked back over my phone and it said that I was at Bigelow Aerospace HQ headquarters. I'd never seen this place so we both just took it in and uh, waited to see what would happen. Now the gates were locked, nobody was there but these vans were almost within arm's reach and so after we uh, kind of fanboyed out over the coolness of where we were and waited to see if there was any interaction going to happen. You know, Bigelow wasn't out there having a Memorial Day barbecue like I was hoping he would. And uh, we didn't play cornhole with Bob. <laughs> not not this time anyway. I, I ended up leaving a business card and then we skedaddled. So um, you can see those uh, shots as well on this video. So that was really cool. That was an unexpected bucket list uh, check mark that we put on there. We went from Las Vegas all the way back out north again to Pahrump. And when we got to Pahrump, we wanted to go check out uh, the king of late night radio, Art Bell's K9 radio station. And unfortunately, it's no longer in production. I think it had a for sale sign on it. And I don't know if that's because of Art's passing. 
Um, then, by the way, Pahrump is a big place. Like I thought, maybe it was just be a hole in the wall, but it's not in a hole. It's it's a big town, spread out nice and wide too. Just about an hour north of Vegas, I believe. Checked out Art and Ramona's grave. I uh, brought a cigarette and left it on Art's grave. I think there were other cigarettes there as well. Did some eye ovulus readings as. Uh, with the spirit box or the the app that I had generated on my phone, didn't really come away with anything noteworthy. And then we went out. Uh, there's a little tour that you can take here, an Art Bell tour, and uh, pass by his house, which is another 15 minutes away from where he's buried. But all in the little town of Pahrump. And so then we had a toast to to Art and made our way out to the ET Highway. And ended out at a ET research uh, gift store slash gas station, and did some shopping there. Noticed next to the ET research station was also an uh, extraterrestrial or alien brothel, and I don't think it was a joke. Like there was a legit brothel next to this gift store, so you could go get your Area Fifty One hoodie, and then you could go get it on with a girl who wears plastic antenna I guess and uh, so we got some pictures of that and then we headed out to another ET research center right after the infamous extraterrestrial sign that's been vandalized and taken down and put back in place and now it's several feet high so you can't really get up to vandalize it and we went inside this research store talked to um research center and talked to one of the gals there the only gal that was working there wasn't really busy for a holiday if you ask me and that's another thing is that the you know the et highway is a large stretch of road with not much going on there but all in all you know it being on the eve of disclosure and it being a holiday I expected a little bit more uh, and this was a weekend i believe this was like a friday or saturday and so we got to talking to this gal, and as um, Aaron's making her purchases at the register, I go back, and I notice that there is a signed poster from Bob Lazar in a tube, and it said 20 bucks. And so I'm assuming that it's not an actual signature from Bob, but it was. It was the last poster that he'd signed for uh, Jeremy Corbell's movie on him, and it was, you know, his signature with a Sharpie. And it was the last poster that they did, still for sale, and probably due to COVID, not sold, after the Storm Area 51, uh, I almost said debacle, but Storm Area 51 event out near the town of Rachel, Nevada. So I grabbed that poster, um, two happy accidents, the Bigelow thing and this signed poster that I'm looking at as well were really cool and then we go immediately up the et highway which is a long stretch of road and end up seeing the little town of rachel and of course i think the only thing in rachel uh, i shouldn't say the only thing in rachel because there's actually another store connected or nearby the little alien which is this uh, cafe that everybody knows about by now where you can stay for I think it was 10 bucks to put up uh, to car camp or put up a tent there. Or you can get a, some lodgings in a double wide and go in and grab a bite to eat and tell UFO stories. By the way, I found out real quickly that they do not like cameras anywhere on the property. Now, I thought maybe you can't go inside and take video or photographs. Um, it turns out that the daughter... I believe it's the granddaughter or daughter of the original owner is running things around there. And she does not like cameras even on the property. And she let me know that immediately. Now, she had a couple drinks in her. I will say that. And the only reason I'm telling you that is that if you ever go to the little alien, definitely find out what the latest rules are and who's had a drink or two because I think it undulates and... Yeah, I was a little pissed off about the way that was handled because, you know, as far as being a tourist traveling three or four days to just go get a, you know, one interview from a truck driver, apparently that's just a bridge too far. 
Um, and there was a, a truck driver there that, that told me some stories, but I was kind of out of the mood to, to get it on record. And basically he was reaffirming what we all know that, you know, crazy stuff happens when you're in the Nevada desert. I also got a story which I wasn't able to record from another farmer that took a documentary crew out to the back back gate of Area 51 where there's still wooden boards up that block the entrance to this top secret facility, right, that Bob La- Bob Lazar has talked about. And um, he was saying that, uh, yeah, there's still back gates that are basically old, crusty uh, barbed wire and two-by-fours put up. And that's the amount of uh, coverage that they have. Now, I'm sure there's stuff that you can't see going on. In fact, he, he went on to say that as much, that the documentary crew kind of pushed the limits and and got the attention of the camo dudes. So let's fast forward to who they are, right? If you go out to Rachel, Nevada, and you stay at the Little Alien, uh, by the way, there is a gas station out that way. You have to phone the owners of the gas station to get gas, but most of the rumors are that by the time you get to Rachel, Nevada, there is no gas. Well, there was. You just have to call these people, and they'll come to the store and get it for you. They're right next door. But some of the people there uh, were pretty helpful on different access roads to go to the gates of Area 51. Now, there's two different gates. You can go to the Groom Lake Road gate, which is about 15 minutes or so. Or you can start off on Bat Gate Road, which is only about, three, I mean, maybe three minutes or so from the little alien. You take this road. Uh, an old gravel road that turns into a paved road, and it takes you to the back gate of Area 51. Now, this is where the Storm Area 51 crew were met with gl- glad-handing camo dudes. Now, they're normally not like this. When you get out there close to the gate, um, in this case, there was really nobody There was nobody else out there except Aaron and I standing next to this gate somewhat apprehensive to what to do next as far as whether or not to get out a camera, uh, how to interact with just a gate. (laughs) But um, I could tell she was uncomfortable enough with the situation that she started to walk back to the car. And as I'm kind of in awe of, you know, the journey that got us there and everything that was happening, uh, she noticed immediately that there was a white Dodge Ram coming up behind our minivan and starts to basically meet this infamous camo dude vehicle checking out our rental van. And as it did, it took a hard right and went up, which we assume was an available dirt road for camping, and sat about 500 yards behind us on a knoll. And then on the semi-paved road, there on the road was a sprinter vehicle parked, a white sprinter van. And then we didn't really notice till even after that, beyond them, in between these two vehicles, further back, maybe another 500 yards behind them, a thousand yards away, let's say, is what looked like another white truck. So all these things were not there when we got there. And there's one road in, basically, and one road out that is your access point from the main highway. And so I I got out my night camera. You can see the footage of us doing some semi-interaction with what I assume is uh, contracted security, these camo dudes. And uh, as we're heading out, I get my camera mounted as I'm driving away to the side of the open window. And I immediately, from 500 yards away, get the lights flashed at me. And as the lights flashed at me, it was kind of hard not to acknowledge the fact that the the vehicle was watching me from 500 yards away get a camera out and acknowledging that fact. And then as we're going down the paved road, we have to pass the Sprinter van, and it's only going to be a few feet away from us because it's a small road. And as we pass the vehicle, you can see plainly that there is someone, um, you know, uh, I don't know how else to say it, but there was a guy probably in his mid-30s sitting there in a short-sleeved uniform with had a badge on the left arm. And I 
simply pick up my fingers from the steering wheel and give it, you know, give him an acknowledgement that we see him. He kind of halfway picks up his hand and gives me a half acknowledgement and tips his head down. And you can see this uh, somewhat in the video, as well as the fact that it did not have DOD license plate on it. And so as we drive off, uh, I do a slow-mo uh, recreation of, not a recreation, but uh, we do some slow-mo reveal of what this vehicle looked like. It's the first time uh, I'd heard anybody talk about a Sprinter van coming in and out of Area 51. Nobody else was in the vehicle that we could see, but the back of the vehicle was blocked out. So then we go back to the little alien with our crazy camo dude story. Nothing more than that. Um, the next morning after we wake up, the weather's kind of iffy, not much going on. Uh, but we do have some new campers next to us, and they decide to go test out model rockets. And so three or four guys head out with their GoPros and some model rockets down the way towards where this RV camp is near the highway. Now, when you're at the little alien, you're being monitored by this crane that is near this UFO structure, this art installation that basically is the sign for the little alien. And this eye periodically monitors the property. Well, they have some other excuse of what this is, like it's studying weather or whatever. But the whole time, you know, everybody's concern is that they're being monitored by the DOD or these contractors. And maybe they are because right after they shot this rocket, out comes off the freeway um, a from the same area as the back gate entrance, a very familiar white Dodge Ram. And there's two different typical vehicles. There's the Ford Raptor or the Dodge Ram. And they're factory white. And this thing comes immediately to where these guys are lighting off these rockets and slowly drives past them and, and watches these rockets take off. And then sometime after that, the owner uh, got a hold of these fellas about shooting model rockets off on her property, and they stop. And so that, that was pretty interesting. And, of course, you know, they probably assumed that something nefarious was going on in, in these model rockets, and maybe they were spying or doing something over the ridge or over the hill of Area 51. This isn't too far from the legendary Tikaboo Pete, which is where Roger Lear and Bob Lazar and uh, George Knapp all went up to uh, find out when these test flights were of spacecraft or back-engineered uh, craft. And there are seemingly test nights where you can have more interaction. Now, one of the nights I suggest looking for strange stuff in the sky is going back to Tonopah with these plasma ball lights. Um, that was a Thursday evening. Now, I had heard before that Thursdays were test flight nights. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are basically ramp-up nights and you know where they do their briefings. But Thursdays uh, are their test flight, and Friday are their debriefings. And then Saturday and Sunday, uh, typically you have those days... I know it sounds kind of weird, but typically you kind of have those days off when you're in the service. Uh, a lot of people just have those kind of banker hours unless we're under some kind of threat level. So that was uh, our experience is that, yeah, you know, it was a Saturday night when we're at Rachel. There was less going on. The weather was bad. So uh, if you want to go out there on a Thursday on a clear night, you may see something. Now, that same day, the next day, we go to Groom Lake Road and go to the back gate near what's called Sniper Hill. Intimidating name, I totally agree. And here we are in our rental van trying to stay out of sand traps, and we run into another Chrysler Pacifica, which is what we were driving on the same road, and talking to a nice couple that uh, were out doing the same thing. We were in the same minivan, so we had a good chuckle about that. So if they're listening to this broadcast right now, um, <laughs> thanks for saying hi to us and um, telling us some stories. We end up making our way to the back area of the gate. And while we were there, we saw the camo dudes. And you can too. Uh, this isn't as though we found ourselves in a unique place invite only anybody can 
travel there as long as you can brave the dirt road to get there. And this camo dude was sitting atop a hillside overlooking us as we approach the gate from an elevation of over 100 feet behind us. And I think there were cameras on us, of course. And But as far as what we experienced over in the back gate, not nearly the same type of intimidation, I guess, was used. And it was a little bit of a backhanded intimidation at that. Nothing too scary or freaky. But what I took away from my trip, uh, because we, we didn't stay the night there, we went back to Tonopah to see if we could capture more of these plasma balls over uh, the Tonopah airfield. That's what I'm calling them until I know better. But what I took away from my trip to Area 51 is the lack of interest. So that brings us to why that would be. I'm still talking about it today that I'm sure Aaron's probably sick of. And maybe you are too, but it's uh, it strikes me as a bit odd that on the only holiday right before the month of June, disclosure month from the Pentagon, there was no interest to come up to the gate, the hotbed of activity, uh, as far as people are concerned, for UFO lore, or Rachel, or any of these little gift stores outside of Rachel, they were all in Vegas with their tops off, because <laughs> they, they weren't out on the ET highway, that's for damn sure. So, very interesting to me, and that gets us to this conscious, conscious control, and you heard Ira talk a little bit about that. You've heard me speak uh, a little bit about that. But in total, my personal thoughts on the matter is why disclosure now in the middle of a pandemic, actually at the beginning of a pandemic, 2017, this article comes out through the New York Times, and where we are now. Well, <clears throat> I think in part it is because we're so distracted and they feel as though they can maybe send this narrative in to the subconscious consciously by showing us what they want to show us. Now, what is that? Mainly DOD, FLIR, and infrared and gun camera footage from these carrier groups or fighter pilots. And there is uh, there's something about avoiding the public sector, common video footage, camera footage that we, we all have that is seemingly better quality. Now, here's the deal, though. Is it better quality because you can see it better? Is it better if you caught it on, you know, a Canon DSLR or a brand new iPhone? Is it better footage than ca capturing it on a FLIR or IR? Well, technically, no. And there's more information on this grainy footage from these battle groups than there is going to be on second-hand civilian cameras, camera systems. So I think that's where this comes from. But what makes me nervous about this, and this moves into the world of Stephen Greer, is if you don't know Stephen Greer's story, a lot of people have issues with Stephen Greer. A lot of people that are going public right now have issues with Stephen Greer. Heck, maybe even I do. Maybe he has issues with himself. But he has been talking about how the military will elevate this conversation to the point where it is the new enemy of the state, the new enemy that we all need, the new terrorist that we all need to look out for. So when the military is guiding the conversation, using the words like aerial threat, you know, pigeonholing the jargon, so you have to kind of fish for it, UFO no longer works, you got to call it a UAP, and so therefore if you ask for UFO information, it it doesn't show up in the, the FOIA request. And all those things are typical for the military. I was in for five years and know it somewhat, but as far as how the U.S. DOD is steering the conversation, it is from an aggressor point of view. That's the way that they are looking at this, and they have arguments for it. I'm not saying they're invalid arguments. I'm saying that we should at least account for the f fact that the DOD has been caught lying before as far as who the actual aggressor is. And there is such thing as a false flag. No matter how Alex Jones it sounds, 
Alex doesn't d- lie about everything when it comes to false flag operations. Maybe we should listen to someone like Stephen Greer, who has been preaching from the pulpit as someone uh, of an insider, someone who says that they have given briefings to high elected officials based upon his knowledge of ET interaction and what he calls CE5, um, which is a, a way of trying to communicate or contact and elicit contact with extraterrestrial. He has been saying for years that eventually this is going to come about as the DOD basically going to war with an alien species and that we all need to get on side and be true patriots uh, based upon our species to confront the new enemy of the state, that being the extraterrestrial or extra dimensional state of ET. So that worries me. It should worry you uh, as well, because we are in a time like no other where truth is only based upon whose truth you're telling. It's known as your truth, not so much the truth. It is um, alternative facts, I think, is the way that they phrase it in D.C. So if you express alternative facts, let's say based upon your query of the E.T. conundrum, and then exponentially float that out there to where we are now with coronavirus, uh, certain things are allowed to be talked about and other things are not. I think that's a value to someone who is starting to spin the E.T. narrative narrative to be uh, looking at the UFO phenomena as some kind of enemy of the state. So, I, you know, I don't know what to say any more than that about it and just keep your eyes and ears honestly open don't even listen to me do your own research and come to different conclusions i'd love to hear them as ronald moorhead always tells me you may be right and i'm certainly willing to listen but uh the fact that the dod in the military industrial complex and their secret programs are expressing knowledge and concern about unidentified aerial phenomena or UATs, unidentified aerial threats, I think is a bit concerning because their first release that they put out here this month, the leak that came out, basically was a dodge to the question about what they know. And they basically said they don't know what they are. Well, I don't believe that because they've had their hands in this for quite some time. I, you know, based upon the amount of knowledge that we've been given here as the populace to derive our own conclusion, let alone our own experiences from personal to family to friends, uh, I think they know a lot more than they're saying. And so when they say they don't know what's happening with this phenomena, but they feel as though it's not another country and it's most likely not a program that we're working on that they don't know about. And the history of the Pentagon, of course, uh, and Luis Elizondo's ATIP program was total hush hush. So we know they serve their interests first and ours way down the road. And if it's not about money, it's about power. If it's not about power, it's about being reelected. And if it's not about that, then it's not about you. So let's play some more audio clips from the live show we did with a couple of our guests here, some listeners to the show, longtime listeners in some case, and um, I'll go ahead and put these uh, calls here back to back on their own UFO perspective. Oh, hey, man, how's it going? I'm having some technical difficulties. That's all right. I can hear you now, man. What's up? How are you doing? I'm pretty good. How are you, Ben? Good, good. Just uh, getting the hang of this live avenue uh, for Zoom, and uh, we're doing all right. We're, We're trucking right through, man. Let me turn your my volume down here. Yeah, get your yeah get your uh, volume get on your own. side, and then we won't have that reverb. So, um, yeah, so we're joining you, and um, we followed your trip out to Nevada, uh, and uh, saw some of your things that you posted out there. Did you uh, see anything that really kind of just made you 
kind of question what was going on around Area 51 or see anything that just kind of jumped out at you? Yeah, um, I was going to talk a little bit about that here in the uh, first part of the next hour. But I will tell you that, um, you know, I, I want to go back. I mean, there's things that uh, you can do once or you can do twice or several times. I feel like I just scratched the surface when it comes to the ET highway. And you know, what Keith is uh, alluding to is there is a YouTube video that just uh, came out for the public and you can check that out. It's the ET Highway. The patrons got it uh, roughly about a week early. And that was a trip that uh, Old Feral Aaron and I made out to the, the ET Highway. And we, you know, rattled some cages as much as we could. And, you know, the Area 51 is a legit place. And we're going to uh, talk all about it. Have you ever been out that way, Keith? Uh, no, but uh, we're have our fingers crossed because I have a new job prospect that uh, might be bringing us out to New Mexico. So uh, if we get that, then uh, we def most definitely will be. Yeah. Now that brings me to trip number two. Uh, the 2022 road trip is already being planned and New Mexico is on the things as far as starting off in New Mexico and going up through Roswell up through uh, Skinwalker Ranch and hitting the ET Highway again or something to that. So maybe we'll be in the same area. I know I've got well, some... I can tell you that if it goes through and we are have all fingers crossed that uh, we will be in uh, Central Ground Zero, right, where you're going to be going then. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, Keith, um, you and I have never talked before, right? Uh, no, no. Uh, my wife and I, we listen to you... Uh, with your live broadcast. Actually, I think we did once before. We did last year when, uh, when you had Ron uh, Moorhead on and you were doing one of the big, his Bigfoot. Uh, okay. Live. So what's your take on uh, the upcoming disclosure? Cause that's uh, what we're, we're talking about today. And I'm sure you have an opinion. What do you think's going on? Oh, well, uh, you know, there's been so much going on, I would say, especially in the last, six months um and you know if you listen to anything about this in the last few years there was always some scuttlebutt that a disclosure would be coming sooner than later um so you know i i think the jury is still out on this um however i do want to say that i think it's very welcoming for dod to come out uh in public and make commentary on the videos. I think that helps a lot. Um, you know, I, my line of work sometimes uh, isn't so much forthcoming to the public. And I think if the public had a better understanding of what was going on, uh, they would receive it better uh, from those sources. Um, you know, I, we always have the intel side of everything that kind of, you know, you can only put out certain things. Um, so for me right now, it's it's still on the uh, the jury's out. Uh, I mean, I would say I totally agree that if our foes do have a higher technology than us, that uh, that's a very serious um, worrisome for me myself. Um, so I guess we'll just have to wait and see how it goes. And do you have personal stories yourself? Uh, well, yeah. I mean. You know, my wife and I, you know, open disclosure, we, to everybody, we, you know, we are, we are Bigfooters and we've had, I've had personally several, several issues, uh, even to what I believe was one right here in our backyard. But, uh, my wife and I, we go out all the time and, uh, you know, it's funny that I felt I'd seen one when I was younger out in California and Los Angeles. When I lived out there, I was probably about eight or nine years old. My brother and I was, uh, was about 11 or 12 then. We thought we saw one. Uh, it was around the Pasadena area we lived. And we never, you know, of course, I used to ride my bike past uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab all the time to go to baseball. But, you know, I never really thought anything about it. And then um, when I was working one time, uh, I guess it was about... It was, Maybe about a year, year and a half ago, I had a uh, work partner who called me uh, over the phone quite uh, 
hyperactive and said that he actually had seen uh, a black triangle um, over our work area one night that wasn't too high up. Uh, no, no sound, no, uh, couldn't hear no sound whatsoever. And that vehicle was being followed by a black helicopter. So, uh, and I, this, this individual is uh, very credible, uh, always professional. I would have no reason to believe that he would lie. I, you know, I went out to the area and looked around and uh, he brought me right to the spot, but we didn't see anything on the ground or any disturbance or anything in the air at the time. So, but uh, yeah, we, we get, I've not heard Bigfoot, so it's pretty, pretty crazy how they sound. Um, so I, we think there's a possibility that they could be connected or interdimensional with those or with the UFOs. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of questions when it comes to how the phenomena connects itself, but it seems to find itself in the same company of the other stuff. And so for that, I just uh, have more questions about it, just like you, but it seems like it's at least a, a fair observation to say that they all kind of hang out together. Hey, I want to thank you for calling in, Keith, man, and uh, continue listening and um, any more questions for me? Uh, no, no. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely stay in touch, and I'll let you know if we head out that way. Um, you probably figured out uh, by now. You know, you see my – probably don't really know, it, know me by this name, do you? Uh, uh, usually I use a different type of name, but uh, this is my more professional one with my collegiate uh, Zoom, so. Right. But, I definitely recognize your name, but I think it's the first time I've seen you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't uh, typically post my face on everywhere. <laughs> yeah. But. And for, yeah, for people that can't see us right now, I've got uh, just a little icon up of me of Zoom, and Keith uh, has a screen grab of him. So it's nice to put a face with the name, but uh, when you call in, don't feel like you have to do that for, for my effect. In fact, um, I myself uh, don't have my picture up right now because there's too many bells and whistles as is as I get to know the, the system here. But um, you want me just to put you on mute here, Keith, and listen? Yeah, yeah, sure. We're just going to continue on and listen. We're okay. sitting right here on the couch. And, uh, okay, and man. All right. Thanks for calling. You're on the air. Can you hear me all right? Uh, no, I just I saw the email and thought it looked uh, interesting, so I thought I'd join in. Okay, well, Miranda, you know, I got to tell people a little bit about you. Miranda and her mother were one of the first to ever show up at our live event that we did in Cottage Grove, Oregon. They were always so faithful, and I was so appreciative of having them in the audience, being so supportive. And you're no slouch to the, the world of the paranormal, but I don't really know uh, of any UFO stories from you or your mom or your family. Would you mind telling me some more? Um, sure. Okay. Um, so I know that you have some ghost stuff. Um, mm -hmm. but what do you think? Let me ask you this. First of all, what do you think is going on with, uh, the soft disclosure coming our way here in 2020, 2021? Um, I think it's about time. I kind of think that there's been, um, more and more evidence coming out and it's getting harder to deny. And so they kind of have to do something. Okay. So are you paying attention to, all of the conferences coming out and the report coming out due to the COVID relief bill and all that. I've heard, I have read a little bit about it. I also was really curious about the um, uh, UFOs that were caught by the Navy ship. Right. Yes. Yeah. Many, many ships. In fact, it looks like each, you know, month, if not every other week, there's a new ship with new footage. Yeah, it's been really interesting. So what have you had your own UFO, UAP, or strange lights encounter story? Would you mind telling us one if you do? Sure. Um, I think some time back I had told you about the one that I seen in my backyard. Okay, um, go ahead and remind the people about the story. Well, I was uh, just about to graduate high school, actually. So, yeah, this was quite a while ago. I hate to date myself here, but... Um, it was year 2000 
and I was filling out some graduation invitations on my back porch with some friends and it's just getting to be about dusk time. And um, there in the neighbor's backyard, they had, we had like this uh, eight foot fence between us. And I swear out of their yard rose what looked like a big giant, just like glowing orb. And it was about the size you would think that would fit about two people. You could probably fit about two people in it. It wasn't huge, but it was still pretty significant. And it just hovered there above their fence for two, maybe three minutes. And then um, just kind of zipped straight up into the sky. And then it, it hovered there for a while. And um, it zipped back and forth. At the time, I was kind of a little freaked out. So I ran in the house. I was trying to get everybody to come in the house with me. I don't know what good that would have done anyway. But um, then eventually we kind of got curious and we went out to the front yard and we could see it zipping around in the front yard. And it's kind of like um, I had the feeling it was it would knew we were watching it. And like it was just kind of putting on a show for us, if that makes sense. Um, and it moved faster than I've ever seen anything move in the sky. And I, I haven't been able to explain it. And um, eventually it just, it, it just zipped away. Like it disappeared in a matter of like half a second. It was gone. Wow. So you, the interesting thing that you said here was that you feel like it was observing you or at least knew you were around to some degree. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those neighbors, too, I don't know, they were a bit strange. You know, we'd wave at them and they kind of just like look at us and go in the house. <laughs> and I don't know if it had any relation, correlation to that, but they were definitely some different type of people. <laughs> Maybe not from around her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we never, we lived next to them for years and never really talked to them at all. And they were like, just, you know, our houses were pretty close together. Yeah, and people need to know that that whole area is teeming with activity, and it's also a, a route for fighter jets. Uh, it's not mm -hmm. uncommon, is it, to see military aircraft going over the lake bed out towards the east, correct? Oh, no, yeah, all the time. Right, yeah. Even in COVID, have things slowed down at all with the military, with the COVID stuff? Um, no, in fact, um, it's, it always gets posted on Facebook, which I think is kind of funny, but there'll be like, um, a squad of mm -hmm. helicopters or something that'll go by mm -hmm. and they usually fly over like either out towards like Rao river area and toward down that way, right. or they'll go up over like I five area. Right. Um, and yeah, there was a whole group of Apaches once. And nobody knew where they were coming from or why. Mm -hmm. And they just randomly flew over. They're like 500 feet off the ground. Yeah, oh, that's pretty low off the deck, yeah. 500 feet. Yeah, they almost vibrated the house. Mm -hmm. They were so low. And there is, I want to ask you and the voice in the in the back, of, is that your, who's talking, is that a friend of yours in the back room, your mother? Uh, no, that's my boyfriend. Okay. Okay, I'll have this as an open forum question, too. There's rumors abound, and I think this fits into the narrative of uh, UFO disclosure, and it's probably just rumor, but that there's a secret base out there in Cottage Grove. Have you ever heard that? I have heard that, um, out Rao River area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but um, no confirmation, nobody knows any more than I heard. No, I haven't really. I mean... I know that there's, um, I think it's fire clay out there, where there's a, been rumors about um, a UFO landing mm. and quite a few stories from back when I was little, I heard growing up right. about a lot of activity out that way. So I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere in that area, there would be something. Yeah. Well, it's a hot area to, to go and experience the paranormal. It's certainly uh, an area that I'll never forget. And when I have a chance, I, I pop in and out of certain active areas, including the Al Moon Lab. But um, 
It's uh, it's great to hear from you, Miranda. And uh, you want me to go ahead and put you on mute? You just want to listen? Sure. Thanks. All right. So you have a point of view from a uh, couple of listeners and experiencers. And Miranda has so many incredible ghost stories. Her and her mother, I believe her mother's name's Karen, uh, live in a haunted house or did and had some really interesting stuff. And nice to meet you, Mr. Luntz, uh, once again. Okay, so now I'm going to play some clips here. Um, we played the John F. Kirby clip, the Pentagon spokesperson talking to reporters about uh, not stepping ahead of the story. Now I'm going to play for you a clip from Officer Val Johnson. Now this is an audio excerpt from his appearance on an old show hosted by John Davidson called That's Incredible, which was airing in the 80s. I remember it very well. And they would have a guest on there that had incredible stories or abilities, kind of like a modern-day Ripley's Believe It or Not. And uh, Officer Val Johnson had a moment with a UFO. I guess it doesn't get much more credible for a lot of us than a police officer driving a squad car having a close encounter with a strange light. The only thing is is that it's all caught on tape, and his testimony I'm about to play for you is um, through the dispatch office of the local police department as uh, Val is coordinating and telling them what just happened to his squad car because there was forensic damage. I think this uh, squad car has a, a broken window and we'll get into how that was broken. So let me play you the clip here from Officer Val Johnson's testimony, I believe in late 70s, early 80s. I was on routine patrol, and I came up to this intersection, and I looked south, and I uh, saw a bright light just over the center of the roadway. My first impression was that maybe it was a semi with uh, one headlight broken out, and then it dawned on me that the light was too big around and too intense for an ordinary headlight. 407, uh, what is your condition? I don't know. Someone just hit my car. I don't know how to explain it. Strange. Are you, uh, what's your condition? Are you okay? Something attacked my car. I heard the glass breaking and the locks, the My eyes were extremely painful, as if I'd been subjected to uh, something like arc welder burn or something. My, uh, there was some salve put in my eyes, and they were covered with that, an adhesive bandage, but in a matter of uh, six to eight hours, they were cleared up. Mr. Meridian French a crash technician for the Ford Motor Company. A request was made by Mr. Alan Henry to Ford Motor Company and uh, through the normal chain of command down to the glass division, I, as the so-called glass expert, was asked to come out and examine the windshield. The cracks in this particular windshield are not unusual in themselves, any one of which I could reproduce uh, myself in the laboratory, but as a group, they're unusual. I'm convinced that uh, the fractures, that, as we see here, were made by some type of a blow from the outside of the glass by some firm, uh, probably hard object, but with not sufficient force to crush the glass, but enough force to bend the glass to the point of breaking it. I have not seen anything like this before. They are extremely unusual. All right, that was the audio from Officer Val Johnson. It was an interesting video to watch. Uh, it certainly looks dated, and uh, John Davidson looks like a game show host talking to an adult film star. It's totally bizarre, but the walk away with that audio excerpt that you heard from the guy that looked at the glass that was cracked or smashed used the word bent, which is a really strange way to describe what happened to this police car, but you got to see it to believe it. And the antenna is even bent in a world, uh, in a weird way as well. So check out that story. Next up, I'm going to play an audio excerpt from astronaut Buzz Aldrin. 
This is a C-SPAN interview that I can only find one clip of this. And I'm surprised it even exists as one clip. Because what Buzz Aldrin is about to talk about is pretty extraordinary. He's, he's going to speak about the moons of Mars and why we should go there. So let me play you this clip here from probably one of the most well-known astronauts in our lifetime. We can visit other people with their habitation. We can keep track. If there's something very important to be developed from the moon, I'm not sure what it is right now. And I sure think we should identify what it is for America to make such gross expenditures again for human habitation on the moon. We can help. We can join with. Together, we can explore the moon and develop the moon. We should go boldly where man has not gone before. Fly by to comets, visit asteroids, visit the moon of Mars. There's a monolith there, a very unusual structure on this little potato-shaped object that, that goes around Mars once in seven hours. When people find out about that, they're going to say, who put that there? Who put that there? Well, uh, the universe put it there. If you choose, God put it there. I just think that's such an interesting quote and one that I think there was a little bit of CYA going on towards the end where Buzz was <laughs> using some buzzwords to squash the idea that E.T. had put some ancient megalithic structures on the moon of Mars and God put it there, Mother Nature put it there, but certainly nothing else um, I believe the uh, the word that they usually use is panspermia, if I believe it right, where life is seeded on a comet and lands on uh, planet Earth, for example, and, and evolution exponentially grows. If that's what he's talking about, then I guess that would be God or Mother Nature. But uh, I don't think that that's what he was expressing in the first part of the interview. Very interesting quote, and uh, I don't know how out of context you could really take that that middle part of the conversation. So the next thing I'm going to play for you may seem a little bit unrelated to the ET or UFO conversation, but I don't think it necessarily is. After all the talking we've done and the interviews that I've done now with Doug Hycheck, the creator of Monster Quest, and his look into what they're calling Waxy Sebum or Alba Vernix, this latent film or oil left behind from Sasquatch uh, after, you know, you've uh, had some kind of encounter. You may find this latent sebum on your windows of your car or in some cases the hammock that you're sleeping in. And it leaves behind this chalky, white, oily substance that's very difficult to get out. Well, I think it's important to follow up on that with the ET conversation because there seems to be this spirit link between who they are and the way they interact, let's just say, from another dimension. Uh, I think the way, the way Luis Elizondo puts it is maybe the best way to put this. They are either from outer space, inner space, or the spaces in between. And for this conversation, we're going with the latter, the spaces in between. So if Sasquatch is no more than a man monkey from uh, an interdimensional portal, then uh, maybe this explains this next audio clip, two audio clips I'm going to play on oily handprints. Now, the first clip I'm going to play was I, I just happened upon this conversation with Dan Aykroyd, who... His, fam his family line is linked to the spiritual movement. His grandfather, I believe, his great-grandfather, if you go back in the Ackroyd bloodline, uh, you'll find that there is quite a bit of interest, and this is where Ghostbusters even came from. I believe it's uh, Ackroyd's brainchild. So here he is trying to promote on Johnny Carson uh, his movie, the original Ghostbusters, and instead, in the beginning, launches into some articles written by this magazine in New York City on the spiritual inquiry, and in particular, 
the inquiry of ghost and latent handprints. So let me play you this clip from Johnny Carson, early 80s, Dan Aykroyd. But these people in New York very seriously treat the psychic phenomenon, and I'll tell you how seriously they do. I'm going to read some of the titles here uh, off the uh, quarterly journal of the American Society for Psychical Research. The first article is Sensory Contamination of Free Response ESP Targets, the Greasy Fingers Hypothesis. Now, the audience and Johnny Carson didn't quite know what to do with this conversation because he went into some length about... uh, other strange articles, but that one really caught my eye, especially looking into the Sasquatch conundrum, which leads down to abduction. It it was my opinion that it might, in the beginning, when I found these handprints, uh, latent handprints in Cottage Grove at the farmhouse of Daryl Adams, but it really came into full fruition when I was at a conference and approached by a ET investigator, Daryl Sims, who has a very interesting pedigree with the CIA, perhaps, and a hypnotherapist, and working with Dr. Lear, taking out implants. And I remember seeing Daryl Sims as a 14 or 15-year-old boy when I snuck into a conference that he had at a community college in Eugene, Oregon. Um, And I'm glad I did because he was on a tour of sorts showing, sharing information, working with abductees as a hypnotherapist and removing um, these implants. This must have been like 1990, 1989 time frame, maybe right after my mother saw this triangle uh, in Springfield, Oregon. And so early on, I remember meeting Daryl Sims and, uh, you know, getting familiar with his work. It wouldn't be till around 2018 um, almost 20 years later that I have him at one of my vendor tables looking at these small oily handprints, these four-fingered, almost rubber-like handprints that we got off of, the, of a door at the uh, farmhouse in Cottage Grove. And after talking to Daryl, looking into some of his work, there's very uh, interesting similarities between this chalky white substance found and Bigfoot situations and abductees. So I'm going to play you a quote from Daryl Sims on, I believe it might be Ancient Aliens. He's uh, having a back and forth with Giorgio Suclios, and he is explaining what all he's found out regarding these handprints attached to people's bodies after abductions or windows and very similar stuff to the Bigfoot world. Let's play this uh, conversation. One of the things we found on these abductees is alien leaves like a fingerprint on them. And really? When they touch them, it leaves a subdermal mark on you in the form of fingerprints mm-hmm. or of long fingers. And there's an example. It impacts the body subdermally. This is amazing. It literally goes into the skin and you can't wash it off. You can't get it off with any kind of uh, solvent or anything. This is in Chile. The lady got touched by this entity with huge prints on both front and back and left caustic burns on her body. So this was visible light. The same handprint literally shows up in several other cases as well. A little girl draws the same exact hand. My estimation as a former police officer is that there was an oil-like substance that apparently exudes from the body of the entity. And it's with connections like what you just heard between UFO abductees and people that have experienced things like Sasquatch interaction or what Dan Aykroyd explained as the greasy fingertips theory um, via ghost or poltergeist experiences. I think we're in some very weird territory that most people aren't going to be comfortable with, let alone look at and try to dissect and do a a podcast about. And that's what we tried to do here. I think these last few quotes kind of point to the certain direction that I'm looking at, that this is something transmedium, this is not something purely physical. These things, elements of UFOs, have this otherworldly, beyond that, other conscious, other vibration interaction with us, and perhaps other dimension. So very interesting times we live in. Uh, Thank you again for those that have called in live and spoken with us uh, when we did our live production. Even the few pranksters that managed to pull off 
uh, some fast ones on us as, as well. Thank you for listening. But uh, I hope you have enjoyed this broadcast, and uh, it was nice to do a long format with you. It's a, like stretching a new muscle for me, and so periodically I, I got to do it. It's a little bit of a, a workout because, um, you know, a lot of this is just your own thoughts, and you got to put them out there consecutively, and now I've done it. Now you know my point of view, and I don't know when we'll be back for episode two. I think... It would probably be fair to say we're breaking these up uh, every three or four weeks. We've got a great one coming for you. I'm on my way again out to Northern State uh, Mental Asylum, also known as The Farm, doing some camping with uh, Aaron and Ron Moorhead coming up as well. And, oh, don't forget that we have some live events coming up at the end of August. And you want to be a part of those, go to stateofbigfoot.com in Wolf Creek, Oregon. To even get a room at the Haunted Wolf Creek Inn, great speakers lined up. I know that the director of the Alien Bigfoot Connection will be there along with myself. Um, And then towards the end of October, around the 27th of October, we are slated to do our live event again at Podcastle. We're calling it Podcastle at the Manresa Castle in Port Townsend, Washington. We'll be streaming those each and every time we do them. I think we're going to do them uh, every other month. So they'll start in October and the next one will be in December and onwards to 2022. So check that out. I'll put updates at strangebrowradio.com. If you want to be a part of the show, shoot me an email at strangebrowradio at gmail.com or just go to strangebrowradio.com. And then don't forget, uh, if you can, you want to and can contribute as little as three bucks a month over at patreon.com forward slash strangebrowradio. Hey, the Wood Watcher stuff is really taken off. So um, if I'm not out uh, culling all the blackberry bushes from the property, I'm out carving uh, cedar faces. And so um, a lot of the time has been directed towards this little side project, which is now kind of coming into a full-time job. It's my busy time of year here, especially on or around uh, Father's Day. So um, I'm not as present on social media, but I will be. And uh, it just comes in ebbs and flows. I hope you guys are doing well. And as always, I will see you in the trees.